Thank you for the uh, lengthy introduction. It's truly a fascinating field to uh, research and study and teach in forensics and wildlife forensics. Uh, my research areas, like uh, it was mentioned, is in uh, wildlife forensics as well as in conservation criminology. Uh, I also explore the organized uh, environmental crimes aspects of the wildlife crime as well. But for today, uh, as it was requested to me, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, DNA techniques in uh, wildlife forensics. Basically, uh, what are the DNA applications which are essential to investigate wildlife crimes and to identify species and what tools and opportunities we have in this particular. So we are going to talk about wildlife forensics and specifically uh, emphasize on DNA techniques. Uh, as it was told to me, there are bachelor's and master's students. So I'm going to, the introductory part of my lecture is going to be introduction to wildlife forensics, a bit in, in uh, overview of the, uh, the field. And then we will slowly move towards the uh, applications of DNA techniques in wildlife, right? So moving forward, uh, I thought that uh, it is important to discuss about wildlife crimes before we uh, move to discussing about wildlife techniques and DNA forensics, right? As you can see on your screen, there are some of the categories which uh, uh, are, are uh, picturized in this particular uh, slide. Starting from left-hand side, you see hunting, which is also called as poaching. Uh, which is quite rampant in developing countries like India. Unfortunately, it is also a uh, biodiversity hotspot. That means we have a lot of wildlife. And uh, because it has a value, that's why people are hunting and gathering a lot of articles related to those wildlife. Sometimes uh, the entire animal or the, the uh, species it's transported, sometimes its parts are important, that's why these are killed and then processed and then uh, traded uh, at an at a international level, right? So hunting is, it is well known, uh, <clears throat> after which there's trading. So when uh, the articles are valuable, such as tiger skin, which is also you can see in this particular uh, picture, the tiger skin has a lot of value in international markets as a luxury item, right? Such as there are other valuable items which are unfortunately in quite a demand in international markets. That's why uh, there is a lot of opportunities and people try to uh, poach wildlife, uh, remove their body parts. In some cases, they process it and then they sell it in the international market. Third is to attempt. Uh, this is this is also one of a wildlife crime, but it is not important to today's lecture because this is this is I don't see any DNA application in this particular space. After which there is abetment. Uh, it is similar to abetment of any crimes where you help somebody to commit a crime. That's what abetment is. So abetting to uh, wildlife criminals is also a crime, but this is also where I don't see any DNA application. Coming on to the third one, uh, which is habitat destruction, which is also a very serious crime. Uh, there is an entire field of research which, which researches on ecocide. Ecocide is killing the uh, ecological spaces around us because of, uh, you know, through uh, industrial revolution and because of that, the effects of industrial revolution and development, we are looking at uh, this particular problem. But again, this is also not a space where we can have a DNA application. In the last, that's the consumption. Consumption where consumerism comes into picture, where uh, people who are not, sometimes who are not aware of uh, whatever uh, articles they are using or consuming contains wildlife. Either knowingly or unknowingly, people use or consume wildlife articles. So this is also a field where I see a potential use of DNA technologies can be applied. So uh, to sum this up, uh, there are three potential uh, uh, incidents that where we can use DNA technology, which is hunting, poaching, trading, and consumption. Uh, these three are potential areas where we can use DNA technology. And in subsequent uh, slides, we are going to talk about it. What are the articles which are important, how these evidences are processed, and uh, eventually we're going to talk about the DNA technology the, the DNA technology which comes behind it, right? Uh, in forensics, it's quite widely discussed and 
probably you also have learned a bit about it, uh, about the biological evidence collection. Right? Uh, but I'm guessing that most of the discussion goes around the evidence collection related to crimes where either humans are uh, victims or either humans are culprits. Uh, but in this case, the wildlife is a victim. Uh, so in biological evidence collection, there is whole uh, evidences, whole evidence as in the entire animal is in the question. Sometimes it is live, sometimes it is dead. Uh, in live wildlife, you would see uh, cases like uh, <clears throat> uh, transportation of uh, live animals for pets, such as exotic birds, right? So sometimes because of the demand, these exotic birds are imported to India from different parts of the world, let's say Africa. And now when these are in transit, if the investigation or if the uh, airport authorities or the other authorities, they get hold of it, they are requested to identify these birds because their species of identification is important, as in what kind of bird it is. Uh, so for that purpose, the ZSI Zoological Society of India is the authority and for plants, if it is a plant which is in questions, it's not just the wildlife, when you talk about wildlife, it's not just the animals uh, who are targeted, but also equally plants. So there are some rare plants which are also in demand and these rare plants, they fetch hundreds and thousands of dollars in the international market. So if there is a plant in question that is uh, that is sent to a botanical society of India, uh, which then identifies which species it is, right? Now, on the other side, you see, if it is a dead animal, then what do we do? So let's say if it is a dead tiger. Now, you, you probably have, uh, probably know about it, that uh, India put a lot of emphasis on its uh, uh, tiger conservation program because India is known for tigers. And the uh, population of tigers has grown tremendously as compared to other countries all around where the tiger uh, uh, tigers are uh, naturally found. So uh, if it is a case where a dead tiger is found in conserved areas, so they has to be uh, have a proper investigation. So they look out for reasons why this tiger is dead. Uh, the reasons could be of poisoning. So tiger must have consumed something which 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 is poisonous to it. These are often cases when there is a human uh, wildlife uh, encounter where uh, places like Sundarbans where uh, uh, because of the human wildlife conflict, uh, the the locals they try to poison the tigers so that they can you know uh, live. So the, if there's case of poisoning, it goes to FSL. If it is a case of disease, it goes to pathological examination. And if it's a case of poaching, then it, it, it is, of course, it's the, uh, it requires more evidence and investigation. So it is a case of forensic examination where how, where, and when, and who are the questions need to be answered. So this is when the evidence is transferred to a forensics lab. In this case, it, is, it should be a wildlife forensics lab, right? Hold on to this thought. We are going to discuss it more in the coming slide. Now, moving on to the other type of evidence, which are in parts, right? So, <clears throat> what could be those evidences? So, evidences like skin or fur. These are luxury items, uh, often which uh, the fashion industry, it, it, uh, the underground fashion industry, most of the uh, legal fashion industry is now banned fur of exotic species or protected species. But the underground fashion industry still exists, so where there is still demand of exotic furs or protected uh, fur or skins from protected species. So if it is a tiger skin, it still need to be identified. Uh, it is further examined. It is further sent for chemical e examination. It is sent for uh, ballistic examination to see if there is a wound or if there is a uh, gunpowder uh, which can be detected, which can lead to further examination. Usually these cases sent to Wildlife Institute of India, which is under Ministry of uh, Environment and Sustainability uh, uh, under the center, which is one of the prime leading uh, research centers in India, which is looking after all the research and uh, education in this particular space. The other types of evidences uh, could be hair, bone, 
blood eat which need to be first stored where ethanol or silica gel is used to store these evidences and these evidences need to be analyzed analyzed for its dna why dna is important dna is the important tool in order to identify its species of course there are other methods but dna is one of the confirmatory methods where you can tell 100% sure that this is the species of this particular article right so it needs to be preserved because DNA needs to be preserved. And it, once it is preserved, it is sent again to uh, these centers which process wildlife articles. Uh, wildlife Institute of India is one of the uh, one of the labs. The other labs could be uh, the Lacons, which is which is uh, which is in Hyderabad. There is one more in Kerala, I think. So there are a few of these labs which have expertise in India to process these evidences. Normal forensics labs, although they may have facilities to process, but they lack expertise. Uh, and also it requires a strong reference library. What, what is reference library? I'll, I'll get to that once we discuss the species identification path, right? The next uh, type of evidence could be the horns or tusk, uh, which requires uh, uh, physiological examination uh, it's, or it's morphological examination, sorry and also DNA-based examination, uh, where these labs, which I mentioned, also cater these kind of examinations. So these could be some of the evidences which can be found in parks associated with wildlife investigation. And most of these evidences can be processed or the questions associated with evidence, these evidences can be answered with wildlife and with uh, DNA uh, techniques, right? Now, <clears throat> that was the general part to, uh, to tell you about uh, what are the importance, uh, the background behind moving to uh, wildlife DNA analysis, right? The third challenge, uh, it could be inbreeding. To explain you what inbreeding is, Inbreeding is when two different species, they breed together. That means a, 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 an animal or a male from a, one particular species, a female from another species, they bred together and they uh, form a progeny, which is of mixed rate, of mixed breeds. That's what, that's what inbreeding is. Right? So inbreeding can be seen in a number of different animals, which are species which are very close to each other, right? So one of the examples, which is which is also one of the challenges for wildlife forensics experts or the researchers, is inbreeding of between wild pigs and domesticated pigs. Uh, <clears throat> now the areas which uh, which the protected areas or protected regions uh, uh, like sanctuaries, which are which are very close to uh, 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 dense population human population. This is where uh, the domesticated pigs can be found easily. And if these areas are overlapping, these areas are potential areas where the inbreeding between wild pig and uh, domesticated pigs can happen. Now, why is this challenge? Wild pigs are protected under Wildlife Protection Act. Uh, 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 Wildlife Protection Act. Uh, 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 section three, and killing a wild pig is a wildlife crime in India. Killing a domesticated pig is not cannot be prosecuted under Wildlife Protection Act, nineteen seventy two. Okay. Now, wild pigs or domesticated pigs have created a lot of problems to Indian farmers. Uh, they go into their fields, they destroy their field, and uh, because of that, the, the, the farmers which have uh, fields near protected areas where there are population of wild pigs, they have faced a lot of problems, especially there is a lot of problem in Kerala. And uh, these farmers had demanded that, uh, they have de made demand to local government to, to allow them to hunt wild pigs because it is these are women's, these are creating problems for them. But unfortunately, by the Wildlife Protection Act, it is protected under the act. And some of the uh, 
uh, cases where which which is evidence where uh, the farmers they have tried to kill uh, these pigs intentionally or sometimes when they uh, when they uh, use electrical fencing this is how this is when out uh, when they use crude bombs this is when uh, the wild animals when they get into their fields they get killed uh, i'm also referring to one of the cases where it happened around a couple of years back i think where um, a, a wild elephant which was killed in kerala because uh, uh, it apparently ate uh, a, a, a fruit which had a, a crude bomb. Okay? So these a, a incidents, these accidents can happen because of human wildlife conflict. Now, in such cases where if there is a case of a dead peak and the forest officials need to identify if it is a wild peak or if it is a, a domesticated peak, so we can use DNA identification technologies to differentiate between a wild pig and a domesticated pig. But if it is an inbred or if it is a product of wild and domesticated pig, then it raises number of questions. It's, it's very difficult to identify if it is a mixture of both, right? So this is, this is also one of the challenge uh, with uh, wildlife forensic experts. So this is about species of origin. So this is when a certain article is identified and it needs to be uh, answered that this particular article belongs to which particular species. So this is when the DNA forensics uh, comes into picture. Now, what, what are the techniques which are used in species of or, uh, origin? That, that's what we are going to discuss now. Uh, <clears throat> with with uh, uh, With wildlife DNA forensics, Mitochondrial DNA is the most preferred type of DNA uh, because of its advantages over nuclear DNA. Of course, nuclear DNA also has its applications, but when it comes to identification of uh, species of origin, this is when the mitochondrial DNA is is very important. Now, why? Because mitochondrial DNA is very robust. With with Wildlife investigations, uh, most of the cases where the evidence is destroyed, evidence is, you know, it's it's not not uh, preserved quite well. Uh, sometimes the carcass or the dead animal is is you know lying in the forest for days, and uh, it gets very difficult to extract DNA from these kind of evidence. So you need something to rely upon. So mitochondrial DNA is robust as compared to uh, nuclear DNA and mitochondrial DNA also found in multiple copies. That means if we have one gram of sample, which is often the case when it comes to wildlife investigations, we usually get a very small amount of sample and we have to test, do a lot of tests on that sample uh, in order to uh, you know uh, answer the questions. So when it's come to that, you need to process and you need to get ex you need to extract DNA. This is when the mitochondrial DNA comes quite handy because it, it is found in multiple copies, right? So this is some of the advantages of mitochondrial DNA. So species testing is done with the mitochondrial DNA. There are some species specific primers which have been already identified. Uh, species specific primers are the identify or specific regions in mitochondrial DNA which are very specific to a particular species or to a particular type of animal. If we are trying to identify, let's say, a deer, what kind of deer it is, if it is, let's say, if it is a musk deer, right? Uh, so if I, if I identify musk deer or a barking deer, then we already have those primers available in our laboratory. This is why I said that the general forensics lab, which deals with human DNA or which deals with human uh, uh, investigations, they are not well equipped with uh, for analysis of wildlife DNA because they lack these kind of data. They lack these kind of references. You need reference samples. Uh, Wildlife Institute of India has uh, a lot of reference sample on a lot of uh, uh, animals 
where they can go back into their repositories to uh, if they are suspected of a particular animal, they can go back to the repositories, take out the, the uh, stored sample DNA, and then cross check if that particular species is the same species. Let's say if there is a uh, there is a uh, medicine which is uh, uh, which is uh, which is collected by police officials, and they suspect that the medicine is made out of uh, made out of tiger bones or of or a uh, beer gall uh, beer uh, gallbladder or any particular species, right? And the species need to be identified. You need, first, you need to have species specific markers. And also you need to have a repository of, of, of the DNA of that particular species in order to cross check if uh, whatever DNA or whatever sample we have received and once we have extracted the DNA, it's matching with the other uh, identified DNA. So this is something called as a uh, positive sample where you know that this is the uh, positive sample of a particular DNA. The question sample is the sample which is extracted or which is which is in question, which is which which is submitted by police officials for its DNA testing. Right. So combining those, you analyze it. And what are the steps? I'll quickly take you through the steps. These are some of the common steps which are uh, which are always referred to. The so you have species collections, and uh, where and you have tissue samplings. Uh, this is what I said by repositories, where you have repositories and we have sampling from the question sample. You extract DNA with these uh, simple steps. Uh, I'm sure that you must, uh, you, you're probably aware of these uh, extraction steps, right? Uh, once the DNA is extracted, uh, nowadays we have those ready-made kits where the DNA extraction can be done within one and one and one and a half hour. Uh, then the, if the once the DNA is extracted, it is further quantified. There are a number of techniques. With the one of the preferred technique is with gel electrophoresis. This is what it is. It looks like gel electrophoresis gel. Once you uh, you are sure that we have uh, enough amount of DNA, then you go for uh, PCR amplification, right? Uh, <clears throat> PCR amplification is when you try to amplify the DNA with the species specific primers, sorry, with species specific primers. So this is when you amplify only those regions which are of importance to you. You don't uh, amplify the entire DNA. It is simply, it is simply very cumbersome and it, it is not practical with routine analysis, right? So we amplify only those regions, then we go for DNA sequencing. Uh, DNA sequencing where we identify a sequence of the amplified regions and we uh, align them with the uh, sequence alignment software. This is how it looks like. Once we have an alignment, so this is the final result of the uh, DNA fingerprinting. Uh, species is the added is the suspected uh, which 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 are uh, available online such as blast which can be compared which is the online repository of the uh, sequence nucleotide uh, nucleotide sequences which can be you know compared in order to identify which species it belongs so this is what a dna species identification i have only 5 minutes i'll i'll, I'll <clears throat> try to wrap it up um, then the further step uh, the further question is identification of geographic origin. Now, what, why uh, this is one of the important questions or in which cases this can be uh, important. So geographic origin can be important in cases where let's say there is a ivory uh, uh, which is uh, confiscated. Ivory, uh, the major source of ivory is Africa. And there are different countries in Africa, which, which is hub, unfortunately, for ivory traffickers. And they have different regulations. And uh, it is very important to know which part of, or which country of uh, from the Africa from which the ivory is source. So this is uh, to understand how the organized criminal works in this particular space. To identify, once we identify which uh, country it is sourced from, then it is very easy for the to uh, to trace back to its origin of that particular crime and to control uh, the whole trafficking network. Right. So this is one of the studies. If you want to read more, this is the paper which you can read. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it talks about the 
uh, reason identification right now how it is performed the reason identification there are uh, there are three steps of uh, geographic origin geographic origin in order to understand if if it is ivory or if it is any wildlife article which particular uh, area or which particular region that particular animal belongs to this tiger uh, is is it a tiger if it is a tiger skin if the tiger skin is from indian tiger it is from bhutanese tiger it is from nepalese tiger or it, it is from siberian tiger we need to identify which region it belongs so this is why geographic origin is important uh, lineage marker is one of the uh, techniques is performed lineage marker is uh, used uh, is uh, relied on analysis of mitochondrial dna uh with mitochondrial dna like like i discussed in previous slide uh the the there are specific sequences which are used for species identification such as uh cit b cytochrome b is one of the genes which is used for species identification but for lineage markers for identification of geographic origin we need we need a uh, hyper variable regions hyper variable regions which are regions which are the, those regions which show a lot of uh, variations right it 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 shows a lot of variations uh, with different regions for example if if we look at the d loop region which is also part of uh, uh, mitochondrial region if you look at the d loop region from let's say a rhino horn or a rhino from uh, from a particular country a in africa it will have a different type of uh, variations as compared to country b in africa so lineage markers are important right uh, then comes to next is microsatellites which are also called as strs strs also have potential applications in human forensics uh, human dna forensics uh, strs are important as you can see in this particular um, uh, image where strs are explained how the strs functions uh this is in case of humans but in case of uh, animals as well strs mean short tandem repeats small segments of dna which have multiple repeats uh, throughout the uh, genetic uh, length which are also important uh, have applications in geographic origin india is one of the countries which have employed this system and have indexed uh, all of the rhinos uh, <clears throat> which is called as rhino index dna system Uh, have, which has been developed by researchers of the Wildlife Institute of India in collaborations with WWF India, uh, which is a DNA database uh, is generated to build a DNA catalog of 749 individuals of greater one horn rhinosaurus. Uh, the database is generated by analyzing microsatellites markers present in the nuclear DNA. such 14 markers were employed to build a database that we cater a baseline for linking confiscated ivory items uh, to the location of crime so if in case if it is a uh, suspected rhino horn it need to be identified which rhino it belongs to or which area it belongs to we have a repository which is developed in india uh, which can be traced back to an identify that belongs to this particular region third technique is uh, snp's single nucleotide polymorphism which is uh, as uh, you may refer to this particular image where there is a minute change in a particular nucleotide or a variation in a nucleotide which can be which is repetitive uh, with generations so it is a very uh, you can also refer to as a minute uh, modification in a dna of a particular individual or a particular species right so it is also one of the important tools in identification of geographic origin moving to the next slide individual identification is uh, the third important questions where you need to identify which particular if it is a tiger which particular tiger and it is usually referred to uh, uh, iconic species or well protected species or well important species such as rhinosaurus elephants uh, tigers in case of india uh pandas in case of let's say china so these species are iconic species where the uh, every individual counts so in case of tigers like i said every tiger in india is indexed uh, it has its own sequence or its number so if it is a tiger skin which is killed uh, which is extracted from a killed tiger in india it need to be identified which tiger was killed right so this is where individual identification is needed for example you must have heard of this particular case where uh, 
<clears throat> William and Kate, uh, uh, they visited India in 2060, uh, Kaziranga National Park. And within 24 hours of their visit, there was a poaching case which was involved where a rhino was poached in the same protected natural habitat where they were uh, 24 hours before. So it's a, it's a serious case. So in those cases where it requires individual identification, if it is a rhino which is killed, if, if it this rhino, if and if there are poachers who are identified and then tra traced back, and if, if they are found with certain rhino articles, uh, in those cases it requires individual identification. If this is the rhino from which these articles have been extracted, right? So this is why individual identification is important. Uh, there are a couple of techniques which can be used. Uh, short tandem repeats is one of the tools that can be used to uh, for individual identification. There is a single plex or multiplex. If there are short tandem repeats, if it is a single short tandem repeats, it's called single plex. If it's a cluster of short tandem repeats, of course there is a, a, a statistical significance which needs to be. So if there are multiplex, that means if there are multiple single short tandem repeats, which is often often the case where it needs to be identified with a multiplex. For example, there is a bunch of 10 to 14 different short tandem repeats, it's called multiplex. So these are the techniques which are used in order to uh, go for individual identification, right? So these are the questions which can be answered with DNA analysis, with potential of uh, uh, DNA analysis, we can answer those questions and then further these answers can help the investigators solve wildlife crime. Unlike, unfortunately, unlike uh, human forensics, we uh, all around the world, not just in India, we have limited resources, uh, limited personal expertise, infrastructure to deal with wildlife crime. So this is need of an hour. And uh, uh, the future also looks not that promising as the steps taken by the Indian government, but uh, let's hope for the best if the, uh, if, the, if the infrastructure is there, we'll be able to cater to all of the uh, the evidences or cases uh, which are happening around in India. Uh, so that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much.